Hi everybody, I'm Scott and in this video we're going to be talking about... No, no, not Care Bears. Fucking network switches. Specifically, this network switch. The HP... Oh. The HP Procurve 5406ZL. It's a catchy name. Learn it. Like me. Kind of. Seriously though, I spend most of my time on eBay in the enterprise networking and hardware section where you can buy things like this. Now this is a giant enterprise switch. In no way, I just want to be clear, am I recommending this for the average homeowner or tiny small business? You know, small business maybe. But like I'm not saying go out and buy one of these unless you have a lot of servers in your house and you need a lot of switch ports. Um, or like me, or you need 10 gigabit ethernet, which is the main reason I bought this exact chassis. You see, I have an HP Procurve something 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 GL. It's back there. Yeah, that's it. And it's a really nice switch. It's just quite outdated. I should back up. This switch is quite outdated. In fact, most any switch that the average person can afford on eBay is going to be quite outdated. The thing is, switches from five, six, seven, even eight years ago from the enterprise sector happen to have features that you can't get in the residential or whatever it's called, personal sector today. You know, the kind of like Linksys and Netgear things you buy for your house. A lot of those are very good, very fast, very reasonably priced. I have nothing against those. But if you need 10 gigabit fiber, you're not going to get it with a cheap consumer model you'll need to get something like this. Now, you get something smaller than this, you can get something nicer than this, newer than this, but not cheaper than this. Seriously, this switch, this chassis with two power supplies, the power supplies usually go for almost 100 bucks each if you buy them separately. I got this chassis, two power supplies included, and this PoE card right here, which is a gigabit card, that's 24 ports, yeah, 24 ports, for a total of 300 bucks. Nice, right? Now this card down here, I bought separately. That's the 10 gigabit card. That only costs 60 bucks. So for $360, I have 24 ports plus four 10 gigabit ports. I dare you to do any better than that. You really can't. I mean, maybe you can get lucky. And I'm not bragging. I'm not saying I got an awesome deal. There are always great deals on this kind of hardware. The only downside is they suck down a lot of juice. And I'm gonna test it later because I don't actually know exactly how much this is gonna suck down but they ain't cheap to run. They ain't cheap to run. Anyway, I spend about 20 cents per kilowatt hour on power. That rhymes too, I should make a song about that. 20 cents per kilowatt hour of power. I really, no, I'm not gonna start singing in these videos. I don't know what the fuck is going on. It's late at night. Now, at 20, cent, now 20 cents per kilowatt hour means that I spend two cents per 100 watts that I have running all the time. There's a good chance this switch will take about 200 watts, which means it'll cost four cents an hour. Four cents an hour sounds cheap, right? Until you remember how many hours there are in a month, which I forgot. Fuck. Well, the math don't lie. If this thing takes 200 watts of power, I'm spending $28.80 a month just to run it. So at 300 bucks, let's say for this thing, maybe 400 bucks for all this crap I have here, it's pretty much going to cost the same to run it per year as it costs to buy it in the first place. So there is something to be said for spending more money on something that's less power hungry. But for a high number of ports and 10 gigabit connections, you'll be hard pressed to find anything that uses less than about 200 watts, maybe 100 watts. But still, 100 watts not cheap, that'll be 15 bucks a month just to run this thing. Now my power is particularly expensive, but do the calculations before you buy enterprise hardware. My electric bill is ridiculous because I don't do the calculations first and I end up just running to my basement and I have to air condition the basement and then the air conditioning plus the cost of running the things it costs a freaking shitload of money. Shitload of money. So that's my first piece of advice. If you're looking at sweet deals on enterprise hardware, remember how much money it costs. For example, foolishly, I bought a Dell R905. This is a few years back, but it was still a pretty good system at the time. 128 gigs of RAM. Boom. Pretty nice, right? 850 bucks. 16 cores, four physical processors, but the thing was a power hungry beast. 500 watts. 500 watts. Let me just do a thing. Yeah, it was costing me like 72 bucks a month 
just to run that one server. So I got rid of it. Then I got another server that also takes about 500 watts and now I'm paying for that. But that one has, in my defense, 36 hard drives, which is a lot of storage that's very fast. Which brings us back around to network switches. You see, I need 10 gigabit. Well, I don't need it, but you know, I want it. Because my file server can push about 850 megabytes per second or more sequential read and sequential write. Now, I'm really the only user, so most of my reads and writes are sequential. 850 megabytes can saturate a 10 gigabit connection because the gigabit connection is like a small fraction of what it's capable of. And I like to edit 4K video like this one, so 10 gigabit it is. Anyway, the point of this video is for me to kind of ramble on about enterprise networking hardware, this switch specifically, and some general things related to it. Um, I'm also going to show you how I set this switch up, which includes physically. I have some more cards for it. I'll show you how those go in. And I will also show you how to factory reset it through the serial port and initially configure it through the serial port so you can get to its web interface. So if, like me, you're a network hardware slut that doesn't have huge amounts of money and only buys the stuff used, you'll know how to configure one of these if you buy it. And most of these things hold true for most of these type of HP Pro Curve switches, the, you know, the multi-slot chassis. You'll find a lot that look like this. In fact, they go back quite a few years, so if you're looking through eBay, I mean, if you see one that just looks like this, don't get too excited because they all look very similar. They all have a lot of slots. Some of them are really fucking old. I mean, like, really old. Like, you're lucky to get gigabit ports with them. Um, most of them are 100 megabit. Some of them even have 10 meg ports for the really old switches. I think, like, the XL series or something. Anyway, stay away from those. The, uh, the ZL is where it's at, I think, right now for price versus performance, which is what this is. This thing also weighs a ton. I mean, these switches are well made. I think they have a lifetime warranty, which is not like some BS Nambi Pambi warranty. I think if you actually send one of these back, even if it's 30 years old, HP will replace it for free or repair it or whatever the hell they do. I mean, I actually haven't had to do it myself because these actually do last forever until they're completely obsolete and they're pretty much trash. But uh, I've heard stories online of people actually returning these to HP, even if they were not the original owner. Apparently the warranty is transferable. If this thing dies, you gotta pay return shipping, which kind of makes it pointless if it costs $200 to ship a $200 switch. So you're better off just throwing it out and getting a new one, or salvaging parts anyway. Uh, speaking of which, as a side tangential note, like I said, the power supplies in this, if you buy them separately, go for about 85 to 100 bucks. Which means if I wanted to, I could part out this switch for almost as much as I bought it for. These things cost a fortune to ship, so unless you're a volume eBay seller, you're not going to get a good enough deal on shipping to make it worthwhile selling one of these. So if you have an old one of these rattling around, part it out. Sell the cards, sell the power supplies, sell all that shit separately, ship it priority mail, flat rate. It'll cost you, you know, 10, 15 bucks, and, uh, and then just throw the chassis out. You'll get more money for it that way probably, and you won't have to deal with the chassis. But yeah, you saw at the beginning of the video, I had a couple of GL switches um, when I made the N. And those are relatively freaking lightweight compared to this. This thing has to weigh, I don't know, 40 pounds? I mean, oh yeah, the FedEx box of chipped in said it weighed 42 pounds with the packing material, and those materials weren't that heavy. So this probably weighs 40 pounds easy. And that's without all the cards in it. That's with just the chassis and two modules. I'm sorry, that's with just the chassis and one module. And these, these cards are surprisingly heavy also. This probably weighs a good five pounds. I mean, it's shockingly heavy. It's got a huge heat sink on it. It's got a lot of shielding. These are really well made. I mean, I'm, I'm not like saying Cisco's aren't well made. They certainly are. But for price and performance, I think the Pro Curves are the best way to go. I'm not like a Pro Curve fan specifically. It's just um, I go where the performance is for the, mo for the money I have. Oh yeah, one other thing I wanted to mention is rack ears. Because sometimes you get lucky and you get a really good deal on something with rack ears. Sometimes, like this one, they just don't come with them. And you're just kind of shit out of luck. And if you want to buy the rack ears, I looked up the cheapest rack ears I could find on eBay for this exact model of Switch. We're going for $100 just for two freaking pieces of metal. I'm not doing that. That's absurd. Fortunately, I had some old rack brackets from another HP Switch or two. Always check your brackets for interoperability. These are for a one-use switch. However, the two holes here, oh, I can zoom in. The two holes here happen to line up perfectly with two of the holes on the side of this chassis. So this rack here can go here, and I have another one that'll go down here. 
So it's got four screw holes on the side. All four holes will be into rack ears and these can hold a screw each. Or actually, if you want to put screws on the top and bottom, they could technically hold three screws each. So this thing will be well supported and it's heavy, so it should be. So if you find yourself in a jam for rack ears for pretty much any kind of equipment like this, first of all, check if you have rack ears on something else that you don't even think would fit, but maybe they would. And if those don't work, find other rack ears with the same spacing on eBay and buy them if they're a lot cheaper than the one that's actually for your piece of equipment. You might have to sort of clue something together using rack ears that don't quite fit, but, uh, and you can always drill holes in brackets that you have or brackets that you can get cheaply and just uh, stick them on the side. It's a little pro tip, even though it's not really pro, it's more like amateur, because if I was a pro, I'd have the actual rack ears. You know what I mean, though. All right, one thing I forgot to mention about enterprise hardware for the home or small office is the noise. These things tend to make a lot of noise. And by a lot, I don't mean this sounds like a vacuum cleaner or like a leaf blower, but it's loud and disturbing to some people. Now, I'm used to that kind of noise. You can hear it right now in my basement. You can see all that stuff behind me. That's making a droning noise constantly. I feel bad for putting it in the videos like that, but I kind of have to shoot my videos down here. This is where everything is, and that noise is ever present. So I'm sorry if it disturbs any of you, and it's understandable because it's just a droning noise. But that's how it is, for me anyway. I live with it constantly, constantly. In fact, complete silence drives me crazy now. But, you know, teach their own. Now, the first thing you'll notice about our little switch friend here, and it's pretty obvious, I guess, is that it has six uh, module slots on the front. Now, you can get a ZL switch with 12 slots on the front. I thought that was a little bit excessive for me. And it could take up to four power supplies, probably sucks down a lot of power. It probably has double the amount of fans. I didn't want to deal with the noise and the power consumption. Plus, I don't need quite that many switch ports. But my uh, GL switch back there has eight slots, and I think that's a better uh, number for me, just because then I can allocate uh, these more cleanly different VLANs, which I'll get into later. But as far as port density goes and port count, this will be more than enough for me, realistically. So obviously all of these modules are interchangeable. I mean, you could fill these slots with anything you want, provided they're ZL compatible. And so I'm just gonna pop these couple of modules loose so we can check the power consumption without any. And then I'm gonna throw all the modules in and check the power consumption with it full. Well, full minus one slot, which I'm saving for later. Now, these are also PoE modules, power over ethernet. So theoretically, this switch can draw a lot more power if it's powering devices over Ethernet, which I'm really not going to be doing too much of. So if you're just running regular networking loads through it, um, it might use a little bit higher power than standby as you're actually pushing data through it. But I think the standby current is what it's going to be using 90% um, of the time. So I think that's a good measure to get. But I do want to see how much extra these modules add when they're on standby and not really doing much of anything. As you can see, it's got two power supplies on the back. Uh, for redundancy, it can run off one power supply. Like I said, the 12 slot module has four. I think it can run off two unless it has a lot of PoE loads on it. Um, if a light load, it might even be able to run with one power supply. Not 100% sure. If you're curious, check the documentation. It also has another handle here. This pulls out the fan tray. You can undo two screws, pop the fan tray out and replace that really quickly. I don't think you're supposed to do all the switches live because it could overheat, but if you did it really fast, you could probably do it uh, hot, which is, which is pretty cool. You can hot swap the two power supplies. I don't think you're supposed to with the modules, although I have done it, at least the GL model, and it worked out fine. Um, in fact, I'm wagering they're hot swappable. I'll put it on the screen because I forgot to look it up. Anywho, so let us see. I'm going to plug in, well, first of all, I have 119.6 volts. I'm gonna set this to watts because that's how my power company measures power. I don't know why it's registering one watt. That's just a margin of error, I suppose, because there's absolutely no load plugged into this right now. Anywho, uh, plug in one of these power supplies. I'll see how much it pulls with one, including during startup. Oh, <laughs> dumbass. Oh, uh, this needs the type of power cables with the keyed plug. Ah, shit, always something, always something. Ha! 
<sighs> this is just one of those days. I'm rushing or I'm not paying enough attention or something. Here's the thing. This is my problem right here. This is the cord that the switch came with. Well, this is the plug for the cord. This is a standard C14 power connector. This is a C15. See the little notch? Yeah, that little notch needs to be there in order for it to fit into the power connector on the back of the switch. Because the little notch means that this is rated or has a cable rated for a full 15 amps and this one does not, which is true and fair enough, kind of. I say kind of because these power supplies are only rated 875 watts, which is like almost a thousand watts short of a full 15 amps at 120 volts. So what the fuck? Like, just let me plug any old shitty cable into there, please. I mean, a really shitty cable might have problems with 875 watts anyway, but for the love of fuck. So I'm sorry for cursing so much. I know some of you might not like that, but I don't know who, like whatever. So here's what I'm gonna have to do. I'm gonna do something that you should not try at home and I wouldn't recommend anyone to ever do. And that is to create your own notch in your own cable. Yeah, it's very unsafe because potentially you could end up plugging this 16 gauge cable into something that actually does draw a full 15 amps and you'd be overloading the cable. So that's not even straight. What the shit? Uh, so don't do what I'm doing. This is just for the purpose of demonstrating this. And if you want to feel better about the whole thing, I'll throw this cable out when I'm done. After I done cutting my hands to ribbons. I and mean, alternatively, I could just cut the notch not the notch, but the, uh, what's the opposite of a notch? I could cut that out of the power supply, but I'm not gonna. Of course, this has to be the hardest plastic in the world. This is a brand new blade, too. It's a pretty big fucking notch. Okay, well, that did not want to go peacefully, but, ta-da! I mean, I kind of fucked it up really badly, but, you know, it's not pretty, but it does fit into the power supply now. So back to my original intention of testing this thing. Hooray! Okay, got it plugged in. Now let's plug this into that thing and look at it here. All right, so one power supply. Ah, ah, ah. All right, switch is starting, went up to 212 watts per second. You can probably hear it droning right now pretty good. Now remember, the microphone is right next to it, so it's going to sound louder to you than it probably really is in real life. Um, just quiet it down a little because it was going through an extra little um, startup phase where it uh, runs the fans at full throttle. I mean, now it's really pretty quiet now. I mean, I don't know if you want it in your bedroom or in your living room when you're watching TV, but it's not, it's not terrible. All right, it's kind of stabilizing around 50 watts, which is good and in fact much better than I thought but this is without any cards in it all right well it's done starting up uh, so still at 52 53 watts I'm gonna plug in the other PSU and let's see that'll probably just draw a little bit more current it yeah okay looks <laughs> like it should not be drawing that much more wow that, oh, that PSU by itself is drawing like 25 watts that's more than I thought it would be what I mean, these PSUs are probably tuned to be most efficient at a higher current draw. So right now, apparently it's really inefficient because the PSU itself, I guess, is using about 30 watts. Okay, but this is gonna be the real test. I'm gonna put in the uh, 24 port gigabit uh, PoE card. And let's see what happens to the power as I push it in. And it is clicked all the way in, whoa. All right, that's using a little over 30 watts, 35 watts approximately. All right, 35 watts just for that car to, card to sit there idle. See, this is what I'm talking about. I think this is gonna take about 200 watts plus once it's all loaded up. All right, and I'm gonna look at the Gibbic module, push that in, and 144 watts, all right. I guess these are hot swappable now. <laughs> no, really, I think they are. Now, some of you eagle-eyed viewers might have noticed that I'm not really taking uh, 
ESD precautions, electrostatic device, or electrostatic sensitive device precautions, which would usually include grounding myself so that I don't uh, build up static electricity on the surface of my skin. Uh, that could be a problem. You can see I'm holding the card though by its uh, support plate and by the shielding up here so that I'm not going to be shocking, shocking any of these chips directly. This is like the ground plane of the whole circuit board. Hopefully that won't spark anything. I'm also trying to lean as much as possible on the switch itself so that its chassis is grounding me. Um, all that being said, I, I've never personally really had a problem uh, that was ESD related and I've taken apart and put together a lot of computers in my day and a lot of other uh, electrostatic sensitive devices. So, I don't know, it's up to you. I mean, if this was a brand new switch and I paid like, I don't know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for this, yeah, I'd probably go the extra mile and uh, take extra precautions. But uh, considering that if this thing dies, it won't be the end of the world for me, eh. Anywho, back to the test at hand. Okay, so we're still holding at about 150 watts. I'm putting in another... Now these cards that I'm putting in right now are all identical. They're the 24 port gigabit PoE cards. So that one's in and you can see shot up by about 35 watts. A little more. All right, kind of stabilized. Next card, 188-ish watts up to 230. All right. Uh, 227, 227, approximately. All right, and the last card is going in now. And they're each, each card is going through like a self-check and startup procedure. Let me see if we can catch this. I just put in this card right here. And you can see all the, li all the lids. All the LEDs are on, they just flash red, and now they're blank which is blank, they're all off, whatever you want to call them, whatever. Which is a good thing, that means it's ready to go because the LEDs will come on as I start connecting uh, ethernet cables to them. Well, providing ethernet cables have a link. But anyway, so yeah, all the cards are in, seems to stabilize, everything started up, all the lights are green, that should be green, so this thing appears to be ready to go. And it is now sucking down about 300 watts. So. Yeah, I was a little off on my estimate, so uh, yeah, this thing ain't going to be cheap to run. Uh, this would probably be like 45 bucks a month just to run the switch. Hallelujah. Uh, yeah, after I take my other equipment down, I'm going to test it because I actually don't know exactly how much current my current, uh, I don't know how much current my current crop of switches draws, but it's probably 300 watts or more, so I'm probably going to break even with this switch. Oh well, but I will get 10 gigabit ports out of it, so that's a, that's a huge plus. And like I said, this is when the switch is doing absolutely nothing, 300 watts. Once I'm running a lot of traffic through it and it's actually working hard, it'll use more. But uh, like I said, 90% of the time though, it's gonna be near standby. It's just my house. I'm not like constantly pushing tons of data. In a corporate environment where each of these ports maybe represents someone's workstation or a really busy server, yeah, this thing will consume a lot more power because it'll have packets flowing through it constantly and at high rates. Anyway, so far so good. I'm going to unplug this and I'll show you some of these cards up close. Actually, first let's take a quick look at the filler blanks that were in the front of the chassis um, covering the empty slots. And these don't look like anything special, but it's just a mark of quality. Like, first of all, they're particularly heavy gauge metal. I mean. They're not exactly super thin and flimsy. They have these nice captive screws with uh, Torx heads on them, uh, T10, I think it was, and um, little springs to keep them, to let them pop out and just get out of the way as, you're, uh, as they're loosened enough to come off. They also have this little, uh, I'm sure there's a technical name for it. I don't know, I'm sure people will write me in the comments and tell me I'm an idiot for not knowing this, but. Um, basically a foam pad with like a wire mesh wrapped around it. So not only does that help seal the air uh, from flowing in and out of the chassis where it shouldn't be, because this thing, by the way, is cross vented. So the air flows, um, fans are on that side, the air flows that way and gets blown out the fans to the side. And I'll show you the heat sinks and why that works out. So this little uh, pad here is to prevent air from getting sucked in the front of the chassis or blown out the front of the chassis. 
it's wrapped in the wire mesh in order to keep uh, electromagnetic interference out of the chassis. So it's kind of like a little Faraday cage. Obviously, it needs some holes in it for airflow, but uh, it doesn't need them there. So why have uh, any kind of electromagne electromagnetic interference coming in through the front of the chassis? So again, marker quality also keeps everything nice and uh, consistently grounded because this wire mesh will also sit up against any modules that are on the front and will make sure you have a good ground plane throughout the whole front of the chassis. Again, nice mark of quality, which you'd expect to see in a switch like this. Because these things cost a fuck ton of money when they were new. Now, as for the modules, whoops, that is the management module. Okay. So, here is one of the 24 port gigabit modules. You can see, actually, let me turn this the right side up. And I don't think this will have a good focus on it, but uh, yeah, it's a lot of focus. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so pretty nice, right? 24 ports. Uh, this is a J8702A is the model number for this particular module. All, every single port on here has power over ethernet. Not all switches have power over ethernet on all ports on a module like this, but this one does, which is very nice. You can see it's got a big old processor module right there. Um, details of that, I don't know. You can look it up if you really wanna know. The fact is you don't need to know. This thing will do what it says it does on the tin. Um, a couple of nice big fat pads here for power and a bunch of sockets on the back for data interface. And also this nice big alignment pin. It's just a piece of metal attached to the circuit board, but it's fluted at the end. So there's gonna be a pin that goes into that hole in the inside of the chassis, which makes sure it lines up very precisely before all these connectors shove into their pins so that you don't end up with bent or broken pins on the inside of the chassis. Um, again, very well made. Oh, and I should also note, you see the heat sink is oriented so that the airflow is meant to flow sideways over it. So they get air flowing through all these little channels right there. Very nice. If anyone's curious, um, each of these chips is a Simplify, S-I-M-P-L-I-P-H-Y, and it's made by Vitesse, or it's branded Vitesse anyway. Again, not sure the details on that. It's not something you really need to know. I'm just uh, letting you know in case you're curious. And this has a manufacture date on it, I, it's, or it's a design date anyway, of 5th of December 05. So this is like 12 years old, but it's still, I mean, really good, at least for home use. I mean, for a huge enterprise, maybe not that good, but for me, this is still excellent. And it's like a 12 year old design. I mean, that's why you can get this so cheap. Oh, and I just want to point out, it's got big fat heat sinks on the back of these uh, shielded modules. Not sure what that's sinking heat from, to be honest. I mean, usually these modules only have LEDs in them for port status indication, but uh, I guess this has more going on. I'd love to tell you, I'm not gonna take this apart though because I, uh, I really need this card. And of course, take a look at the 10 gigabit module. Obviously the form factor is pretty much the same. Uh, it takes less power. You can see it only has one power pad on each side. And that's because this doesn't have power over ethernet because it's fiber optic and that would be not literally impossible. I mean, I guess if you could pump enough light down a fiber optic cable, you could power something on the other, on the other end with it. But uh, as far as I know, that's never, ever, ever done. Holy crap. This module is actually so new, it still has the protective film on it. I mean, this module must have cost a shitload of money when it was new. Uh, what is the date on it? Copyright uh, 21st of March 05. So this also has a design date of 2005. It could be a lot newer than that. Well, not a lot, but it could be newer than that. So uh, yeah, I don't think it has a manufacture date on it. I'm sure you could get it from the serial number. Yeah, it's such a nice little card. Hang on, static bag. Actually there's tape on there, that's not good. Good enough. All right, now of course this module by itself it has no ports on the front. It just has slots for yet more modules. So this takes the aforementioned gigabit interface converter. This is actually a spare I have. That's why I cover it in green tape to keep um, dust out of the optics because I don't have any of the fillers that usually are supposed to go in there. Again, this came used on eBay. I think it was like 30 bucks. These brand new would retail for a hell of a lot more than that. 
And let's get a close up of it. Another big fat heat sink, the whole top of it's basically one big heat sink. And that's to sink the heat away from the laser emitter that's in here. Now this is an SR module, which means short range. They also sell long range and uh, the other. Um, you can see it's got a 10 gigabit ethernet spec and a 850 nanometer laser. Anywho, point is this goes right into the slot in the front of this and these are definitely hot swappable and it just sort of seats right in there and voila. And then to come out, it's got a little release mechanism on, on the front. You just literally pull the front of the connector out and that releases it and then it pulls right back out. And it's got little uh, pins on the side that, yeah, you, can, you should be able to see that. Cool, huh? And I guess I'll show you the ports on it. Yeah, there you go. The laser emitter and receiver in there. Mmm, sexy. Now, of course, you can do 10 gigabit over copper, but uh, as far as I can find, this is, except for power consumption, <laughs> the cheapest way to get a bunch of 10 gigabit ports nowadays, at least in the context of a larger switch with a lot of other, you know, regular gigabit ethernet copper ports or whatever kind of ports you want. I mean, this thing will take all sorts of different modules, so you can have various mixes of media on here. Um, it's a, they mentioned it's a good switch. I really like it. All right, and now I'll show you how to set it up and maybe factory reset it if it's necessary. But anyway, I'll show you how to get into it in the first place if you are in the same position I am that you just bought one of these used off eBay or somewhere else. All right, that I'm gonna shoot uh, next time though, because this is already getting ridiculously long.